Hi, I'm Madeline Rice. I'm Nathan Fisher. And this is our heat engine design. Eddie is also here. <laughs> here in spirit. <laughs> We idealized the thermodynamic cycle of the heat engine in two four steps. So the first, so the first process is a, is constant volume heating when the when the um, canister of air is transferred from the cold water bath to the hot water bath. So in this process, the, the air the air heats up heats up and increases in pressure until it reaches reaches um, the pressure get, becomes high enough for the air to lift the piston. So after this pressure is reached. Then it goes into the second process, which is um, isobaric expansion. So the air in this process, the, the air stays at stays at, the, at this pressure, but increases in volume as it lifts the piston. After once it's once the air has reached its maximum volume, then we move it from the hot water bath to the cold water bath. Then and it goes into um, isochoric cooling. In this process, the the piston stays at its highest position, but the pressure drops. And once the pressure is low enough for the piston to move down, it enters its final process, which is isobaric compression. In this process, the piston moves down while staying at a constant pressure. At the, at this, after this, it reaches its initial position. These are the equations we derived to calculate the maximum work that could be done by our heat engine. So we started by adding up the network done by each of the four um, processes that make up the cycle. If you, um, if you look at the PV diagram, you can see that there's no work done in the, pro in the um, processes between states 1 and 2 and states 3 and 4 because the volume change in these processes are ze is zero. So you only have work from the, se from the second and fourth processes. Then we plugged in these, we um, plugged in um, the cold temperature for T1 and the hot temperature for for T hot and calculated the volume at um the vo calculated the volume at state 3 of the at state 3 of the cycle so the maximum volume then we plugged that we plugged that back in and simple and simplified it to come up with the, the with a, an equation for net work so work net equals p2 minus p1 times v times the rest of the stuff circled after we found the network equation, we then attempted to find the value of P2 that maximizes the network. So for this, we had to derive the network equation with respect to P2, and we, sol and we solved that to find that P2 equals P1 times the square root of the hot temperature over the cold temperature. We plugged this back into the network equation so that we could find the maximum work done all in terms of P1. Since we don't, since we, so we didn't have to solve for P2 analytically. After that, we um, solved the equation to find the optimal, to find the optimal value for the, to set the initial volume of our heat engine to. After we found an equation for the maximum work, for the maximum work done, as well as the optimal initial volume, we then plugged in the, we then plugged in the parameters the actual parameters for a heat engine to solve for the maximum work that it could do. The cold temperature of our engine was 273.15 Kelvin since it was um, the temperature of ice water. The hot temperature was, was the temperature of boiling water, so 373 Kelvin. And we calculated the maximum volume of the canister of air, which ended up being 8.3 times 10 to the negative 5 meters cubed. The initial pressure was 100 kPa since it was just atmospheric pressure. And the mass of the, the and the mass of the arm of our engine that the piston had to lift was two, was zero point two seven six kilograms. We plugged these values into the equations we derived to find the initial mass of the air and the initial air volume. We then plugged these values into the maximum work equation to find that the maximum work work that could be done was zero point two oh two joules. With the, with this, we used um uh, we used the work balance to find that the maximum maximum height that the piston that the en engine could lift the arm would be two point nine nine three inches.
All right. So here I have our mechanism for converting and storing the potential energy. Um, uh, the method we went with was a vertical tower um, with ratchet and pawls. Um, there is a lever attached here with pawls that went into the um, slots on the sides here, um, which were connected to this um, kind of ratchet, um, which also acted as our weight. So in the ratchet, um, you can see that between our two guiding um, boards, we have the actual kind of angled slots, which the poles would kind of fit into and push up. Um, these, uh, the idea for these sliders on our um, ratchet were to um, guide it through um, our tower and also to make sure that the um, poles were constrained in our horizontal direction and so that they would only be you know pushing up and then dropping back down where we wanted them to and they wouldn't lose contact um, when we didn't want them to. Um, now these uh, in theory uh, were great but what they ended up doing was causing um, a large amount of friction um, because of the MBF. Um, so this actually um, caused a significant energy loss uh, through the friction and it was just could have been easily streamlined by switching it to um, acrylic possibly. The reason why we didn't choose acrylic initially was because we it is a heavier material um, and we weren't sure um, and we just went for MDF but it turned out that we should have gone uh, acrylic there because of the uh, lower coefficient of friction. Looking more specifically into the design, we can focus on our lever arm, which moved the poles uh, and translated the energy from the expanding um, gas in our um, heat engine uh, into kind of that vertical motion in our ratchet. So here's a video from our testing, which shows the arm being pushed up, and then you can see a pawl on the inside um, attached to the lever arm which then pushes up on the ratchet um, internally in our tower. This um, video is actually um, rewinded when it goes down because one thing that we also didn't take into account was the again the friction and how the lever arm would actually get stuck up and not have enough weight to fall back down when the piston um, lowered itself. And so as a result of this, um, I had to lower it down manually, thus inputting work to this system and cutting our actual work done or potential energy stored by our engine. We cut that in half because I had to do half the work to push down the lever. So in our project, we had a number of sources of errors, which led to a deviation from our calculations to our actual result, um, starting with the act uh, our structure in our design. Um, one of the biggest sources of error was the friction again, as stated before, as well as the pinching that was created on the um, ratchet by our sidewalls that we're guiding. Um, this pinching was due to the space um, kind of taken up by the hot glue that we used to connect everything. Ended up making everything um, a little bit off on the tolerances we expected them to be. So as far as some errors in the work calculations we did, and there were a number of is issues. For example, we assumed that the cold temperature would be to, would be 273 kel Kelvin, so the freezing point of water since we were using ice water. But it was probably it was probably a bit warmer, especially towards the end once all of the ice in our cold water bath melted. Additionally, we assumed that the piston was frictionless and massless in um doing in setting our work balance. It probably the manufacturer's website did say it was a frictionless piston, but 
there was obviously some friction and mass there that we should have taken into account, so that would um, minimize the actual work done. To cap off our video, we were going to talk about some of the things that we could have fixed or could fix for a next iteration if we were to do one. Um, one of the first things uh, that I repetitively mentioned uh, was the friction. Again, we could change it to acrylic. Um, another important thing was right here is this nub where we attached our bearing um, for our arm. And we just hot glued it on. And in the last two seconds, maybe, it broke off and our thing came crashing down from give or t significant we had significant loss of uh stored potential energy there so not hot glue the bearing on next time for something that has a decent amount of stress and kind of torques being applied to it um and then finally i think we in our next design could have um accounted for um the hot glue kind of taking up space and give it additional tolerances for that. Look at that.